Hi guys, I have a question for you today. In front of us is a woodpecker, but do you know which kind of woodpecker it is? I have to admit that when I knew of the name, I was a little surprised because I'd been calling it incorrectly all my life. But my question for you is, do you know it? So I'll be revealing that later in the video. And I'll also be sharing some things about its lifestyle, habitat, and why it's a little bit of an ornery bird. Okay, so let's talk about the painting. So this is my most recent watercolor painting. I think many of you know that I am now teaching watercolor and acrylic painting classes. And when I am teaching, I just assume that my students don't have the same brand or the same colors that I have. So when I'm teaching my lessons, I talk about the colors that I use and help my students decide what color that they will be using that is most similar. So in front of us, you can see that we're now discussing the two kinds of reds. Now I have other reds in my palette, but I identified two reds that could be appropriate for the woodpecker's head. So I'm putting them out, testing them out, and trying to decide what red I'm going to be using and explain this process so that my students can also be going through the same process. So my two reds are quinacridone red and perylene red. Now, as soon as I laid them out against the white background of that dish, I clearly knew that the perylene red was my color because if I was going to use the quinacridone red, I was going to have a pinkish head on my woodpecker, which would be very inappropriate and very unrealistic. So I have the perylene red. I do a similar discussion over those earthy oranges, which ones I chose, and also which of the two pale greens I chose. And then once the colors have been chosen, I give a full list of the supplies that are used. And you can see that I have all the materials out there, and particularly I have a number of brushes. We're only using three of those brushes for the actual painting, and two of them are kind of the trashy brushes that we will use for the masking fluid. And I separate those brushes because we have quality brushes and some of the, you know, the trashier ones that we don't mind messing up a little bit. Okay, so now it's time to paint. One of the unique characteristics about watercolor is that we don't paint with white ink or white paint. If we want white, we have to think ahead and think about how to retain that white. And the way to do that is to use masking fluid. So I'm using a masking fluid very heavily in this painting. And anywhere I want the curly cues or those little filaments from that grassy, mossy texture on the tree, I'm going to put in a little bit of white or the masking and it will be white later. So actually I put the masking on in two layers. So I put some little swirly curly cues here and there and then I put let it dry and then I put a layer of paint and then I do another layer of masking fluid on top of that with more curly cues. Now this isn't normal or it's not really common method of retaining white, but it actually saved me a lot of painting time by doing it in layers. It's kind of complicated to explain, but anyway. So you can see that I'm putting down a lot of masking fluid. I have to let it dry and then I can begin the painting. And to start the painting, I didn't want to just dab in some paints. I wanted to put the paints in some water, a sheen of water, and let the water kind of distribute the paints and create kind of a softer background. So the first thing I did was with my two inch wide Neptune brush, I painted some water across the entire paper. And I did that uh, maybe a minute, and you can see by the sheen that I have, there is a little bit of a buckle already. So I don't want to put too much because the paper will buckle too much. So after I put the sheen of water on, I added in some Payne's Gray, some Indian Throne Blue, 
Verona Gold Ochre, which actually I decided not to use because it was too pale. And then I just started using raw sienna. I painted those three basic colors in some areas I needed a little bit of a brighter color more of a browner sense and that's when I added in some transparent red iron oxide which is M gram so my other colors are all Daniel Smith and this is my M gram My colors are looking a little bit you know glum and not so bright and so I decided unlike the reference photo there was a hint of green but I added quite a bit more green to my painting I just thought it really contrasted nicely with the orange so then I introduced some serpentine green also a Daniel Smith color just a matter of layer by layer building up the paint. So once I got the colors kind of how I liked them, I needed to let the paper dry. And you can see that I'm using a hair dryer. I like the hair dryer because I can speed up the process, but I'm also careful not to use a high temperature. If you use a high temperature with your masking, you could kind of melt some of that masking into the paper or make it really difficult for it to pick up. So I don't use a high temperature, but I do use the hair dryer. And then on that dry paper, I add in another layer of the masking. And as soon as that is dry, I can begin the painting. Once the paper is dry, then I put just a quick swipe of water, just a carrier sheen of water. It's not going to carry a lot of pigment, but it will carry enough so that when I touch the paint to the paper, it's not going to make a hard line. It will make it a little bit softer. So on this second round, I have just a little bit of water down, and now I'm painting with more detail. And that's typical. Every layer that you paint, there's going to be more and more detail. It will get finer and finer. So I'll speed this part up and you can get an idea about the amount of detail that went into this painting. clearly see that this layer is not only about detail, but it's about increasing the contrast. Uh, 
Okay, so now it's time to start painting our bird before we paint all of those that mossy area. So some of that mossy area is going to cover the bird. So let's paint the bird first and then we can finish the moss later. When I paint my bird, I like to start out with something that's really high contrast. And I can start with the eye, which I'm not really comfortable with on this particular bird. I'm going to start with the beak. And it's a very dramatic beak. It's dark. I'm just going to dampen it and then paint in a light bit of the Payne's Gray. Let that Payne's Gray bleed around in that damp area. And then as the moisture evaporates, then I can start adding the detail. And that's when I get the line between the two beaks and a little bit of the edge and the nostrils. But this is all done very carefully over time. You don't do it at, in one layer. You can do it wet in wet, but it's more like wet in as it dries. So then of course I'm going to paint the head, which is quite dramatic. I'm using that perylene red. And I even touch in just a little bit of raw sienna around the lower part of the neck just to give it a more natural transition from red to the body of the bird. Because if you only do red on the top and you know white and black, you're not going to have the contrast, you're not going to get the dimension. So I'm letting the colors build that dimension. One of the tricky parts of this particular painting is the bars on the back of that bird. So the bars are not horizontal. They are a little bit at a diagonal or an angle on the back itself, but on the shoulder they do seem to have a little bit more of a horizontal slant or non-slant. And so just pay attention to how the bars are so you can get the realism. And the same applies for that tail. Okay, so my woodpecker has some pretty good color on it. I might add a little bit more, but now I need to lift the masking just to see how the woodpecker and the tree and all that moss kind of go together to make a picture. So I'll be lifting the masking and then touching up some paint. to the final stages and that's grabbing back some white and yes I did use that masking but that's never enough so there's always a little bit of maybe a dot in the eye or some highlights here and there that's what I'm doing right now and I'm starting to do it with the gouache white gouache but it's not working so well I'm not getting good coverage so I switch over to the echoline liquid watercolor it's like an ink and then I'm getting really good coverage and a secret about both gouache and this white watercolor ink, if you don't like how bright white it is, you can always, after it dries, just tint it a little bit with your paint. And so now is probably a really good time to talk about our woodpecker and what kind it is. So I don't know how many people have guessed it, but this is a red-bellied woodpecker. Yeah, I didn't put any red on that belly. I didn't see any in the reference picture. And so a lot of people don't even notice the red. You have to be looking directly at the belly, more or less, to see a small quarter on its belly that is red. And there might be a little bit of red blending in the, in the feathers on the stomach area, but not a lot. And you can see that I put a little bit of red feathering on the head just because that was in the reference. So this is a red-bellied woodpecker. Uh, the males have more distinctive red heads than the females. And for the females, they just have the back of the head is red. 
Many people might confuse these with the red-headed woodpecker, which is actually dramatically different. The red-headed woodpecker has a very dramatic bright red head, very black body, and very stark white markings. So while the colors are generally the same, it's obviously the patterns are very different. So maybe you're wondering where in the world do woodpeckers live? And I can say they live in almost any country. Exceptions are Australia, New Zealand, New Guinea, Madagascar, and then of course North and South Pole. So this particular woodpecker, the red belly woodpecker, is commonly found in the eastern part of the U.S. and southern areas. Okay, so I said I would tell you some interesting facts about the woodpecker, and I have to say that there's one enemy that the woodpecker has, and this is threatening a lot of birds. So this enemy is called the European starling. They're an invasive creature. They don't have any natural enemy, and they're just everywhere. But they tend to chase other tree-dwelling birds away, as in, you know, these bird, the starlings like to live in the cavities of a tree, and so do owls, bluebirds, and woodpeckers. And so the starling is their biggest enemy. One really interesting fact is these birds, they like to hang out at your bird feeder in your backyard. And they will cling to the side of the bird feeder and eat the seeds. They have even been known to get into your hummingbird feeder and sip the nectar. Now, I also said that they're very ornery and they do chase away all of the other birds, so you don't really like these kind of birds around. The only other bird that they won't chase away and that is a lot ornery than this one is the blue jay. And if you are interested in a blue jay painting, I will link it up above and you can watch that one also or many other paintings. Guys, I really enjoyed painting this. I hope you got some really nice tips out of it about the nature, about the painting itself. And if you're interested in painting this, it will be available later in the fall.